now you will appear, but if you're not, yeah. then you won't. <laughs> 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 Well, for those that are all here, I will endeavour to start. Um, <coughs> rectification. When I first spoke to Roy and said I'd like to do a lecture on rectification, he described it very well. He said it's a skeleton in all our closets. And I rather like that, because it is. Because no matter how good in astrology you are, we do depend on our clients or our guinea pigs or whatever we call them for a very important fact, and that's the fact of birth time. Now the term rectification is a little bit of a misnomer to this lecture. You all go, no, you see, I'm not really going to rectification. Um, because rectification really is the fine-tuning of a known birth time, or an approximate birth time, within what you call an approximate birth time, an hour, half an hour. And that really is rectification. That is when you have a chart that is about, almost, just before, or a little after. And you set up the chart and you have a starting point. And by talking to the client, the guinea pig, or the person of whose chart it is, you fine tune it and you tie it down. And that's really rectifying the chart. What I want to talk about this afternoon is creating a speculative chart. And that's a different thing because it's no guideline. Now, there are various ways that if you, have, you want to erect a chart for somebody and you do not have a birth time, there are various tools that the astrologer can use. Very often, a solar chart. I personally feel that I can't relate to the lines of, ephem of an ephemeris. I can't look at an ephemeris and start to put a chart together. A chart only becomes an individual to me when it goes onto a three, 360 degree circle and then, then the aspects start to fall into place and it, I can start to relate to it. And the first tool, of course, is probably the solar chart, where the, the sun is put on the ascendant, so you're ascendant and the sun at the same minute and degree, degree minute. And from there, you have a starting point. Or you can do it putting the sun on the MC. I mean, it's, or you can take a, we said to the lady today, in the beginner's class, she wanted to do her chart and uh, she didn't have her first time. And I said, well, what time would you like to be born? She and she said, gave a time. And it was a starting point. At least it puts it down on paper and you can aspect it and you can start to work from there. Uh, a lot of people will go from physical characteristics of the ascendant. But for those of you who have been to prior conferences where we played little games of getting all ascendants, or like ascendants, up in front of the conference and saying, well, these people all have Taurus ascendants. Do they look alike? And you've got um, somebody like Peter Beggs, who's six foot seven, and then somebody who's five foot four and who's short and very squat. It's obvious that the ascendant doesn't necessarily have characteristics that will determine the birth chart. You know I mean? um, there is an, uh, another very important one, too, I think, that it's a feeling thing, an intuitive thing. That very often you can go through and you have no birth time whatsoever and you can go, thr go through the signs and you can definitely cancel out some. Now this will depend a lot on the planetary positions at the time of birth. If you have, uh, you're looking for something in Scorpio, there's a very definite Scorpion flavour to the personality and they have no planet in Scorpio but they have Sun opposition Pluto, well then and don't necessarily look for a scorpion ascendant because you've covered that contingency. The other things to look for too are if you have a su the sun changing sign on the day of birth, that can help, but then again it may not because you may have Mercury and Mercury's going to be in one of the two signs, so are you going to have sun and Mercury together? Or you have sun, moon, sun Mercury and Venus? So you're still going to get the flavours. It isn't going to necessarily help. Sometimes it does. The moon, by the same token. 
Another one that I like, because I'm very, in, very interested in tomorrow, I'm going to talk about, on Sunday, I'm going to talk about overloaded houses, that if you have a preponderance of planets in one sign, within so many degrees, you stand the chance of having what we call an overloaded house. And by an overloaded house, I mean a house that has four or more planets in it. And that is a, is a phenomenon on itself. And very often that can help tie a, a time down or give you a lead. But all these things are only giving a lead. Um, about five years ago, Don Forrest came up with a, an idea of rectification. And he touched on it briefly and he didn't carry it any further. I then went into it a little bit uh, it interested me, but like so many things, I shelved it and put it in off course. And I since brought it out again, and that's really what I want to talk about this afternoon. What I'm doing is I'm using a system to create a speculative chart. And I said this morning, it is not perfect by any means. And it doesn't, there are certain birthdays or birth dates that it won't work with, which I'll explain. It's, I work it out on an event. Now, it has to be an event, not for the sake of the event. I'm looking for an event that has meaning to the person. Now, we all have events in our life. We go through all sorts of events. And I've had some very um, traumatic events in my life that have not actually changed my attitude to anything. There have been things that I have lived through. Other events I've had to live with. And I'm looking for an event that you have to live with. So therefore, to do this, you really need very close tie up with the person. When I say tie up, you'll be able to work with the person who's chart your rectifying very closely. You're looking for a crossroad point. Looking, looking for more than just something that happened to them. You're looking for something that happened and really affected them. Something they had to live with. So, first thing you do is the chart I'm going to do, I'm going to go right through with a chart that I have done. I have got two that I'll go through. Um, I've but the chart that I'm going to do is unknown birth time and it's the 7th oh, I'm not nervous, I just normally break chalk up in my hands the 7th of Feb 1926 this lady, she's a lady, was born in Sydney, Australia and oh, won't take, now, so it, I don't know whether anybody wants to have a look at it a few minutes. I haven't. I seem to because what you have to do first of all is to just go to the attendance for that for the birthday, 1927 for the birthday. <coughs> And the first step is then what I do is I write down all the I write down all of the planets out of the ascendant into a column. And what I'm looking for is aspects from the personal aspects. Personal planets to outer planets. Now, obviously, as you go through and you look at it, you're going to get personal planets. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, it should be pro progress aspects, actually. Progress aspects from personal planets to outer planets. Sometimes there will be planets, in this particular case, it is a, uh, it's Saturn square the sun, which it squares natively. So anyway, I went through... Saturn culminating in the square to the sun, rather yes, than the sun. Yes, yes. Um, the sun is applying to Saturn, so it's in actual fact it's 
uh, Saturn in the ephemeris, mm -hmm. 25, Scorpio 27. Progress sun to natal sun. Yes, so progress sun, it's, it's when it exacts the square. But at this stage I didn't know that. I went through and I listed all of the, when all of the personal planets were going to progress, the put, make an aspect, and I was looking for squares and squares oppositions and conjunctions. It's no, there's no point in looking at your soft aspects because the native does, they're not traumatic enough. They come and go. So I went through and I listed all of the planets, all of the <coughs> progress aspects from personal planets to the outer planets. Progress, sun, exacting its square to Saturn. Progress, sun, um, progress, Venus. Went through them all. And I progressed them up till, till she was about oh, 35, 40. And I went back to her with a list. And I said, right, I said, what happened um, at such and such? And we sort of, she found it a little difficult at first to remember. So then in the end, I said, well, what do you consider the most important of all of those years? She said, well, nothing really, because she said, when I was 11, I had rheumatic fever. And that affected my life. My whole life has revolved around the fact that I've been left with a rheumatic heart. So I said, when you're 11. So I went back to the, the ephemeris and I looked again and there was nothing when she was 11. And so anyway, she did a little bit of investigating and she came back to me and she said, no, it wasn't when I was 11, when I was 11 it was when I was 7. Mm -hmm. And it was when Progress Sun ex exacted its square to Saturn. So I said, so I then, um, I was at this stage, I had done others that, that I couldn't prove. This one I had a chance of proving, and I said, well, in what way has it affected you? And having rheumatic fever doesn't, to me, as a child of seven, didn't seem to me terribly traumatic. And so she went ahead and she told me that she had a year off school, and during that time, as a seven-year-old child, she grew from whatever a seven-year-old child is to about five foot ten. And at, at, when she went back to school at nine, she was five foot ten. She couldn't play sport. She wasn't allowed to participate in any any sort of activity. She was like a um, a bird in a gilded cage. But by the same token, because she was at home so much with her mother, her mother leant on her. She couldn't do anything outside, so she did things inside. She became a surrogate mother to her younger brothers. It taught her responsibility. She became responsible. She then says, she says now, I have never had a childhood. I've been caring for other people since I was seven. So, right, so we took that. So I took that and I said, right, but I need something specific. Now this is really the formula. Is everybody with me so far? Or have yeah, I, I think you're in progress, you mean just a year, year degree? Year. Oh yes, right. No. Thank you, Arthur. <laughs> I'm use, I use uh, a day for a year progressions so that each year in the ephemeris equates to one year of life. Right? Is there anybody who not, doesn't understand? So secondary what, yeah, secondary, secondary progressions. But, you know, does anybody not understand what I mean by that? Well, the ACD and the whole bit. Well, we have no ACD because we have no T figure. So you just use the birthday as a date. At this stage, I'm using only the birth date because I have no ACD, because I have no T figure, because I have no birth time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to work backwards. So, um, there's something else you said then, Arthur, that dropped my memory. Right, now, does everybody understand what an ACD is? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Some people say no, they don't understand what an ACD is. Yeah. Right. Well, the ACD is... How do you, I find this one hard to describe. Would you like to tell me everybody what an ACD is? I know, fine, but... Yes, it's very hard to describe. An ACD is, when we, when we set up a chart, we have the sidereal time from the ephemeris, right? And then we have a T figure. I'm using the star formula to set up a chart. Now, the sidereal time out of the ephemeris is either at midnight or 
it's either a midnight ephemeris or it's a noon ephemeris, but it's a starting point, right? Let's call it a midnight ephemeris, it's just up to one. And then we have a T figure and an A figure. You don't need the R. And the T figure, 10, 10, 20 there. And our T figure is the time factor to bring our personal birth time in line with our sidereal time at Greenwich, right? So our S figure relates to 0, 100 hours at Greenwich. And our T figure makes the adjustment for the time. So it personalises the sidereal time, right? It makes it personal to that particular chart you're doing. And using the T figure, you work out the planetary progressions. The planetary progressions are corrected on the T figure. And the moon moves 12 degrees, around about 12 degrees in the, in the 24 hours. So therefore you have to, it moves um, two degrees, two, a degree every two hours. So therefore it's the T figure that's going to determine how much movement you have in the moon from that line of the ephemeris, right? Now, when you're using a day for a year in progressions, that each line in the ephemeris equates to consecutive years. So your T figure, you, if you want to progress a planet down to a specific day, you need a T figure. So every time you progress a chart, you have to set up a chart, reset up a chart with a new T figure for that day that you're looking for the progression. Well, we have a shortcut. We use what we call ACD, um, NED, Accelerated Noon Date. ACD, what does ACD mean? Adjusted calculated. Thank you, Adjusted Calculated Date. Where it's taking up that slack of your T figure or your birth time within the year for progressions. So that if your ACD, my, my, my birthday's uh, January, my ACD is June. When I progress my chart for any specific year, those are my progressions for June. It's my astrological birthday. It's taking up the slack of your T figure. Right? Does it make it easy? <laughs> <laughs> I'll go on and then I'll go. Way of using the midnight ephemeris. If you were born eight hours after midnight, then you can go. Uh, eight hours back from your birth, mm. um, eight hours worth of 24 yeah. back will give you midnight, it will also give you a day before your birth. Yes. Or you can go the other way around if you go on, you know, say, four hours before midnight, then two months later than your birth, or four hours worth out of 24, yes. two twelfths. The midnight figure in the ephemeris will represent that date, two months afterwards. <coughs> right, you can use that as a standard date all the way through. You can just read off the midnight figures and say, okay, this is going to be... For the ACD, whatever equates to the ACD. So the ACD is using months to take up the birth time that we have in hours. That's why you have the months into the 24 hours. Anyway, I'll go ahead and see if I made it clearer. Right. So, I now knew that something that really affected this person, something that she has continually lived with, happened when she was seven. This is the youngest one I've had. Most of them happen sort of more midlife. I mean, to seven was very young. So I had natal Saturn. Saturn in 25, Scorpio 27. And progress sun exacts its square to Saturn. They are square in the ephemeral set, square natally. But Natal sun in the ephemeris. Mm. 
1934, Progress Sun is at 2534, 1933, Progress Sun is at 2433, and 18. Now, some, somewhere between 19... 33 and 1934, within that 12 months, by progression, Progress Sun is going to exact its square to Saturn. And I want to find out when. So I find 33, take one from the other, and it's, there's one degree 42. <coughs> That's the movement of the Sun within a year. That equates to our daily motion when we're setting up the natural chart. That's the year's movement of the sun. And during that movement, it's going to exactly square that. <coughs> uh, we have three Saturn positions. We have the maple, the progress, and the inverse position. You'll have the three Saturn positions, the little square, the maple, the progress, and the inverse position. Yes. But at this stage, I'm working just on the natal. <coughs> Right, so that then becomes my A figure. <coughs> my A figure in a formula. And also, I'm going to use that on a calculator, <coughs> so I'm going to convert that down to degree, that degree down to minutes and points of a, of a minute, so that I just used an ordinary calculator. And it's 60. Let's see. Sorry, where did you get 60? One degree, 60 minutes. Oh, okay. 60 minutes. 0.7. I've converted the 42 seconds into points. It's very easy of conversion. Right. The next step is to find out... Now, if we had a T-figure, and if we had a birth time, we could then find out using our birth time and our ACD what date that happened on. But we don't have a T-figure, so we don't have an ACD, so we have nowhere to work to find out when that's going to happen. So I want to find out then which it's the closest to. Well, it's obviously closest to the to. She says obviously look at me in her notes behind the back one. <laughs> Nothing right at this moment, it's very obvious to me. Right, that's the closest one. 25, 34. That's um, Saturn's natal position. And that's the closest progressed progress sun, which gives us a difference to 7. Minutes, right? Everybody, all right, that far? And four seconds. <laughs> Right, now, the formula to find out, if Dennis has just worked out, is, I'll call that B, that difference, A is the difference, or the movement of the sun's progress position during the year where the aspect's going to be made exact, B is the, the difference between our natal planet and the closest progress position. And the formula is B times 24 divided by A. Or as we have here, 7 times 24 divided by 60.7. And this gives us a time difference between our natal Saturn 
and the aspect becoming exact. It's a time factor. It's hours, minutes, and seconds, the answer. And the answer in hours, minutes, and seconds, <coughs> it's two hours, 46 minutes, four seconds. And that's hours, I hope I'm not the only one that needs it. Yes, I'll go over it again. It's, uh, well, basically all we've done is we've found a progress um, aspect between a personal planet and an outer planet. We found out when it happens. Oh, and a, a personal planet and an outer one. Oh. An outer one. So they have a sun squaring Saturn. Mm. We found out when it, what years it happens, what the diff, what the amount of movement is, what the amount of movement is between the outer planet and the progressing the planet that's making the aspect to it, which in this case is the sun. And we've used this formula here, which is b times 24 divided by a, which is our constant factor there, right? Now. So now, this is probably the hardest part. Now we've got a time difference. We'll just call it time difference. <coughs> I actually was writing this all out on cardboard last night and David came by and started to correct my spelling mistakes so I decided I'd do it without the cardboard. <laughs> now, at this stage, we really need the cooperation of the person for whose chart, for whose, whose chart we are doing. Because now we need a date of the event. And this can be a little bit difficult. And it's very hard to ask a woman in her 50s to go back and tell you what happened when, it, she, was set, when she was seven. But because it was important, and this is usually you'll find this, if something is very important to people, they will remember. And she was born in Sydney, and when she was seven, she had a very small baby brother, and her father took her, her older sister, and her younger brother to a parade in the city, and it happened on the, what is equivalent to our Labor Day. And she caught <coughs> it. But she had to stay out. They stayed out too long or something, all related back to this baby brother, which later on has brought up quite a resemblance to the baby brother too. And she got a cold. And through the cold, she got rheumatic fever and very nearly died. It's an absolute miracle that she didn't die, apparently. So then, and it was definitely, it was Labor Day. It was Labor Day. It was Labor Day. So, or what they, Australians call Labor Day. So I rang the Australian consulate and they were very good, and they actually even went back to 1933 and found out the date for me, and it was 2nd of October. So then I had a date. Now, it's very hard <coughs> to sort of tie that down, because the question is, arises immediately. That was the day she caught the cold, but how do we know that the cold was going to turn out into rheumatic fever? Obviously we don't. But even if you... That happened within a week or so. So the sidereal time of that date isn't going to be very different. You're still within the same area. So, and you have to have a starting point. At least we're getting a starting point. So can I take that bit off there? Is everybody mm -hmm. here? <coughs> yes? Do you have an idea of how, over what period of time she was quite ill? A year. A year. A year. Um, a year, or probably it wouldn't have been near when she was critical. I don't know what the actual time factor was that she was... Um, she was a year off school. She was a year off school. Uh, but, uh, then mum might have kept her out of school longer to look after the kids. I don't, I don't think that that was... I think that there was a little bit of that. I think that carried on. But she was a year off school. And... You know, she sort of blames the fact that she's never been able to do sport. And that's what if she was hospitalised, would there be a request? There probably would have been, but whether there would be now, I don't know. But the most interesting thing is her dreams that she had while she was ill. 
she has a dream of her um, sister, of her climbing a wall, and she was hanging to by the top, to the top of the wall. It was a brick wall, and it had a, a sort of a, you know, like a flat top on it, and hanging on to the wall. And her sister, trying to peel her fingers off the top of the wall, and for years she's very angry that her sister was trying to peel her, her fingers off because she knew she'd fall. And it wasn't for a lot later, and I said to her, yes, your sister was sending you back over. She thought that she was going to drop on that side. But the symbology of that is that wall. Mm. 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 So, right, now, yes, we go to the 2nd of October, 1933. Turn my paper the right way. And the sidereal time for that is... Forty-one. Oh, this board's off. Three. And that's the side real time. Did you say forty-one? Yes, I did. I left that one. So that's the sidereal time of the day of the event. I use the word event very loosely because I don't want to just make it sound event orientated. It was the effect of the event that's important. And then we take our time difference. Now because here, we're working to the greater <coughs> of the progress sum's position. We're going to add the time difference. I know this might sound like a contradiction to when you're working to the greater, you tend to subtract, and when you're working to the lesser, you add. But in this particular case, when we are working to the greater of the progress positions of the personal planet, we add the time difference to the sidereal time of the day of the event. which gives us a figure there. And that is the sidereal time of our ACD. Are you adding because that's uh, Because I'm using hour. the greater here. It's midnight. It's a midnight sidereal time. That's why you add, I think. Oh, right. No, you're wrong because it's, um, I can act, cause if, it had, if we had been working to that one there, the lesser, we would have minus that. But we're adding because it's, I know, I know it seems a contradiction I've been backwards and forwards over and over and over it because everything told me that it should be the other way around but it's not. That comes up in a minute. So in a minute Dennis will tell us what the ACD is. I don't know. I don't know. I'm working that way. Oh, actually. Well, you then go to the ephemeris. Somebody got an ephemeris? Open. And look up and tell me what the day is, what day has the sidereal time that's close to that? Before or after the day. You're going backwards. Before the natal birth time. Right. 13th of November. What do you look for in the cameras? You take that, you take, <coughs> you take your birth, 
you have your, if you, your birth, have your famous yeah. open to your birth date, which is 26th of February, which was what you've been working on, right? And the sidereal time of 26th of February is 9.05.25. And that's lesser, so you go back. That's why you go back, Arthur. Because the sidereal time of your birth date is 9.05.25. 26th of February is 9.05.25 and you go back and you go back by the sidereal time not by the month because November is after February if you stop and you see you've got a continuum which one comes before which so you go back on the, the sidereal time of your birthday and that's less so you go back right you go back to you find that. You work backwards in the ephemeris, you just flick through the pages. Until you come to that. Until you find that sidereal time. time. You do it you can do it for any year. I mean it doesn't they'll be You're looking for that figure of three seven oh seven, I see. Right, so on nineteen sixty two, the seventh of February was nine oh six thirty two. And I want to find out what day or date had the sidereal time of 3.27.07. 9.06 is greater, so I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back. And it's 3.27. It's the 13th of November. So, it, so that becomes our ACD. But the fact that we've gone back in the ephemeris is important. Right, I'm running out of board. Can I take this first part off now? Now, can you see that? February 1926. We go back to that and we write that down. It's 9.05.25. 3.27.07. And we minus from it the sidereal time of the ACD. Sorry, I, I'm a bit awkward. How did you get that top figure, S9055? That's the sidereal time out of the ephemeris for the day she was born. That equates to the 7th of Feb, 1926. Right? That that's the that's sidereal time that we would start, set up, start setting up a chart with. I see. Right. That's a personal sidereal time. A, no, that's, a, that's straight out of the ephemeris. It's the midnight, it's a midnight oh. sidereal time straight out of the ephemeris. And this is the sidereal time of the ACD. And we minus that from that. 5, 38, 18. And that gives us our GMT birth time. Now, I know a lot of you do a star formula that only pluses. So therefore, there may be a discrepancy here with the way I do my star formulas, because I do a star formula to the nearest midnight. I plus or minus my T figure. How many people use star formula? Do, do you all um, just plus your, S, your T? You don't. You, you'd do it the, my way, wouldn't you? Mm. You don't use 24 hour clock or is it plus? Yes, we well, see, I you don't. don't. I um, plus or minus to the nearest midnight. Mm -hmm. So I have worked that out on this. 
This is worked out on the plus or minus the nearest midnight. It may work out with the 24 hour clock, I don't know, but I haven't tried it that way. I'm not, you know, I'm not au fait with that. So that's why I just brought that up after the class this morning. So that's GMT birth time. And so therefore, because I have, I have minus, and I minus that figure the whole way through, incidentally, this ACD from the sidereal time of birth is always a minus. And if the resulting answer is under 12, well then it is a AM birth time, because that equates to 5.38 AM, which means it is 3.38.18 local time Sydney. You need to forgive about that. We have 3.38. <coughs> Well, it's 10 hours ahead, so it's 10 hours difference, and that is p.m. local time. Local time. If it had been a, an Auckland birth, it would have been 5.38. Right? Is everybody with me? That's fine if it's Sunday to... <coughs> if it's to progress, then it's uh, six hours one way, and if it's to inverse progress, then it's six hours That's why I've done it to natal Saturn. I mean, it oh. has worked out on that to natal Saturn, because mm -hmm. that's what that formula will be worked, it's worked out on the natal position of Saturn. Mm -hmm. So, I then have a birth time, and I then have a T figure. So the logical thing then, of course, is that to go ahead and set up a chart. Now, I have set up the chart for this and I would like to then put the chart up and I would like people's comments on it. <coughs> I suppose in many ways I'm wanting you to tell me I know this chart fairly well, I know this person very well. And it's very hard to um, be objective. So I'll put up the chart for I have quite a few. I'm not going to go ahead and do the staff formula and set up the chart. Nobody wants me to set up the chart, do they? I'll just put it up. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I suppose you can see it down there, can you? Mm -hmm. So that was the chart I came up with, and I took one look at it and I said, I don't like that. I wasn't terribly happy with it at all. So I went back to her and I said, um, well that means you're bored 3.38 in the afternoon. And she said to me, oh that's near enough. I said, what do you mean? She said, I didn't like to tell you, but after you started, I wrote to my sister and she reckons I was born just before four. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, would anybody like to make any comment about this native? We've got Gemini rising with Pluto and Cancer in the first house. We've got T square. Perhaps I should tell you something about her. She's in business. She's been in business since she was 20. She married and came to New Zealand when she was 19. Um, that Saturn square, the sun, has uh, followed her all through her life. I know no other human being that has worked as hard or as diligently all her life. I couldn't see the overloaded aches at first. Then I found a very interesting point. She has one daughter, but she has four grandchildren. First thing I didn't like about it was the moon in the fifth. I wanted to take the moon out of the fifth and put it into the sixth. So I did. But when I did that, I lost something else, which I'll go into in a minute. So I tried to find a... I played with the chart. I think I've done a chart. A chart for every degree of Gemini rising. Um, but, oh yes, she has four grandchildren. Two of the grandchildren are Scorpion sun signs, but all four grandchildren have sun in the eighth house. And that does not tie up with the, their parents' chart. But the, I, 
the Scorpio, the grandchildren, and it's a very close bond between the three generations of this person, him, her daughter, and her grandchildren. So then I thought, right, progression is for the next thing. So I then progressed, and the logical thing that I was looking for, I was looking for something when the progress <coughs> ascendant came round and conjuncted that Pluto. Now, that's fairly, one would expect that to be fairly traumatic. On that chart there, I then reset the chart up and I put the moon in the six. When I put the moon in the six, with the, with, with it as it is there, I got progress descendant conjunct Pluto, or just past the conjunction to Pluto, when she came to New Zealand at the age of 19 as a war bride. Knew nobody. Came from a very close family uh, in Sydney and then off to New Zealand. Arrived in New Zealand and with, with no contact with anybody except the sort of... As you lost my progression and that was what I liked. I liked the fact that I had progress ascendant to conjunct Pluto and that's done for the 8th of July 1974 that she arrived in New Zealand. She arrived at 4.35 in the afternoon. Did you move the ascendant by the afternoon? No, no, I moved the ascendant. So then I then went through all of the things that had happened, went through all the major events in her life. The interesting thing was in, in looking for Uranus going over the Ascendant, which happened in 1946-1947. But with those two, two charts, they're so close that when you get something like transit in Uranus going <coughs> over an angle, they kind of retrograde and go back over it so that either of those could be valid. Because we're talking about at least an 18-month, two-year period. So it really didn't tie it down very much. The thing that I really liked, or wanted to tie it down, was by putting that into there, but then I lost that. Mm -hmm. So, I'm sorry. The moon, I wanted the moon in the sex, but I couldn't have the moon in the sex and have progress ascendant conjunct Pluto at the time of the coming to New Zealand. There's also the fact that progress then says, is coming up to conjunct the moon too. And that, I, I, I have worked out when that happens. So I, no, I, I won't go through all the progressions in the next 20 years of her life. Um, I suppose I would, could say that I... I could, could say that I got about what one would expect when one does a chart and progresses it. So sometimes you get something, sometimes it's very disappointing because you don't get all the things that you would expect, certain things. And for some of the happenings, when she went into business, um, 1964 was a very good year, the year her marriage broke, her daughter went overseas. Um, the progressions in transit to the angles then were lovely. When she had a, another very bad relationship in her life a little later on, which I expected, which cost her, her, her a lot in terms of emotional, mental, financial resources. It showed up nothing. But it, this was the most conclusive. But it still remains a speculative chance. There's no way of proving it. Well, that's how. 
I would say yes. I think that um, depends on what level. If you have a major event that's happening in a person's life, an event that is going to be catastrophic, traumatic, dramatic, um, that changes a person's way of life, then you would expect all levels of progression. Progress dangled, progress from supervision, and change it. And you'd expect them to all go be bing bing binging, you know, with perhaps the progress moon just being a timing factor that causes them to all go. And it would be still a lot of progress in it. Yes, I think that probably for sort of tuning, fine tuning or tying it down, you're looking for transits to the angle. It's hard, it was harder with these particular ones. If you had um, the six signs, over the angles recently, I mean, since all Libra, we had Pluto going through Libra, and you got uh, Libra and Ascendant, it was a nice time to tie it down. Uh, Saturn going across the angles is mm. usually late. Uranus is usually spot on time. Um, Saturn's late, Uranus is on time. Neptune's very, very hard to to use because I mean it's so diffuse. You don't really learn anything from Neptune. You get more from Neptune going through a house area. But uh, that was the main progression that I sort of got with anything, with any major thing that happened. But I, once I got that, then everything was either just coming or just going, and there was nothing that's conclusive there. But the child is rectified on that. Yeah. So that's my starting point. The thing that you've got to always go back to is does the natal chart fit? Does the natal chart fit that natal? Uh, some people would say that you've got a fixed house here and there, it's so near the cup. Exactly. You know, can you go through a door without opening it? That's what I came to, and <laughs> the conclusion <laughs> I came to. Um, how Does that actually fit the nature? Pardon? Could you find the fact that the nature chart does fit? Well, I find it very hard to be objective. I think it does. I've gone through all the attitudes with it, I've gone through money. Um, I like the cancer on the second house of house, particularly with the Neptune in it. I sort of said to her, um, I tried to get a Leo reaction to money, and then she became very objective, objective about it and agreed with everything that I said, uh, which made it very difficult to sort of with being very, very um, agreeable. But. Um, <coughs> Yes, I like the cancer in the second house, but I like it in my own sex. You know, because there was definitely a combination of both there. Better than just having the Leo attitude towards money. So, Yes, I, it seems to suit better in cancer. Then she would have had a hard time actually finding out what she did find. Yes, with a Neptune in the house. And um, she's done better than that. She would have, you know, her own, her own values rather than the values of the person in the house. She says that she lived for 20 years, she lived a very social life. And she put over a very social attitude towards life. And she always said, I didn't, it wasn't me, I did it because it's what my husband wanted to do. It wasn't my way. It was sort of not quite, not quite he made me do it, but it was his wish, not mine. That isn't the real me. That wasn't really the way I am. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, one time she got some headphones. There's also the fact too, as a result of the romantic fever, she could only ever have one child. And she very, very nearly died giving birth to that one child. Mm-hmm. That in the first one of King's Square. But her four grandchildren have become very much the surrogate children. She refers to her grandchildren as our children. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I've learned to live with it. <laughs> <laughs> this is my mother's chat. That's why I know her so well. <laughs> <laughs> what made you want the moon in the sea? She is now, well, she's one thirty six, so she's coming up fifty nine and she works an eighteen hour day still. She's a manufa- clothing manufacturer and I have never known anybody with romantic heart and all who can work the way this woman can. She's a workaholic. Well that's a fairly good argument against practical discount cups then. Yes, I'd agree with you. I would agree with you. But then as we just said, you can't go through a door without first opening it and that on this chart, or on either chart, the moon is so real close to it. But, you know, it, it was a case of I had to sacrifice one thing for another, and which really did fit, and I could justify both, but I did like to cancel the world. But, as I said, it still stays a speculative chart. I have no way of proving it. Other than the fact that a sister said that she was born just before four. So I then went through the same system with a chart that I knew very well. I decided I would do her daughter's chart. (laughs) (laughs) And I did it using exactly the same system. I don't want to go through all the maths again. And when I started astrology, I went to my mother and I said, what time was I born? And she said to me, you were born just before two. And I said, well, so I looked around and I had birthday books and that sort of thing. And all of them had 2 a.m., 2 a.m. So I set up my chart for 2 a.m. And then at that stage I was very involved with Don Leone Forest. And Leone said that most people are born slightly earlier. And there's something I didn't like about it. So I played as we play with our charts. And then Don had a little dabble with my chart. And for at least the last seven years, I have been living with a chart of 14 degrees, 27 Sagittarius rising, which gives me a birth time of 1.43 a.m. So I then set about using the same formula. And I got very used to my chart. That is the chart that I... have been living with. Or living through, I'm not quite sure. (laughs) So I took the formula and I thought, right, if I can do that. Now I had a very devastating year, year, about five years ago. I went flatting, which probably isn't very devastating to most people, but when you go flatting in another city from the city you're living in, can be, particularly when your husband and four children don't go with you. And it was a very traumatic time that I am still living with and will the day I die. It was very traumatic. Um, everybody else has got past for them, but I still bear the scars. And I used that particular day to go the same formula, as if I didn't know what time I was born. And that came up with 2.01. Now that is the chart erected from the birth time that we thought we liked seven years ago. And that is one minute away from the time that I was originally given. And the question really now I'm asking myself is where is my Jupiter? And I honestly at this stage don't know. It's like I've been out of the test last, last, last month. Mm. 
not really. It was just after my second return. It was a very, very low period. Yeah. Uh, not enough opportunities, more support. That would be, uh, with the natal Jupiter in the 10th, it would be career success pretty much unlimited, wouldn't it? Uh, no, I think Jupiter's missing because of the hell of a lot. Jupiter's always the potential is there, but it depends on whether you use it. Also, often it should be, right? Well, it's retrograde too, I suppose. Mm, yes. Mm. All of the outer planets are retrograde. The Very good because the Jupiter connection there would be, yeah, I'd like to go in that direction, but I'd like to go in that direction. It will go, but I'd like to go in that direction, but maybe that one's better. And by the time I've made up my mind which direction I'm going, I've gone nowhere. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I know the feeling. So would that affect your energy? Very definitely. Yeah. Very definitely. Sort That's of more like one, yeah. didn't really know which way to go. I just, ultimately, in the end, I just went. <laughs> That's <much> weird. <laughs> right, um, right, well, I'll, I'll leave that now. Now, is there anything you want to go back onto the actual formula of the rectification? I need, what I wanted to do is, I wanted to give you this formula, so you can all go away, work on it, you know, play with it, and then perhaps next year one of you can give a lecture to either prove or disprove it. it it, it seems to have potential. The fact that I could get that chart without knowing, without using any birth time. I have also gone through and I have done, I tried to do it for people like the royal family and things like that, but it didn't seem to, because I was taking dates of like the day that the king died and the queen went to the sign, but I don't know how that affected her. You know, I sort of... It was too impersonal. I think you really need to be able to do it with pen. Mm. Yeah. So it's probably something that was people would have got that in the pen. So it's probably probably things they can jump into the pen the conjunct that and something. Um are there any questions? It's always one of these isn't it? Pardon? Yes, I used one event. I did actually go through um then and just and do a couple of other events. But they were events I chose to do. I did her marriage on my, on my mother's chart. I took, she had, um, oh, I can't remember now. Oh, no, it was my father had progress sun square Neptune at the time of their marriage. And I progressed his chart on that because his marriage really was, but it was my interpretation of what I thought. Uh, but of course, I know he's no longer alive, so I mean, it's, and he's been dead nearly 10 years, so it was very hard. I was sort of doing it on memory, and you know, it was, it was more of a mental exercise than anything. But I did do my mother's progress and mother's chart on a couple of other events, but the events I chose, and I didn't get this result. But she's the one who's so emphatic about the Saturn square, um, progress on square Saturn being the event that, cha that shaped the rest of her life, is the way she put it. Shaped the rest of my life. So the effectiveness really uh, works on making the decision that the progressed son is, is the one to work on. Yes. I have found that it seems to be a progressed son aspect more mm. than um, I've done. So it's, it's not going to be much good for somebody that you can't come up with a... Right, so you've got, there's no way you can do it. I mean, this is why I say it has limitations. It is not a foolproof recipe that you can sit down and use on every chart because it just doesn't work that way because if you've got somebody who is not going to have a progress sun to an outer planet aspect um, at the age where they can relate to it, I mean, you don't make it a very early... Perhaps, you see, she was very young. I mean, she <coughs> was very young. I would have normally said that that was too young to progress it on, but it seemed to work. Well, it seemed to give me a result. Whether the result works, any time will tell. Actually, you could ask people in advance, you know, when you're just getting a dark summer, some event. Like the romantic fever, it's hard to remember that. Yes. I think with my father, he's told me I was through the name. Right. A woman who, like, might have got married and changed country. Well, you see, if I've been looking with my mother's child, if I've been looking for um, an ascendant, the progress for a change as drastic as that change, I would be looking for an ascendant aspect of Pluto. 
So without going through all of the rigmarole of the all that, I could have said, right, well, when, you know, where's Pluto? Let's have an aspect, and you go on about it that way. But it was interesting that I came to Pluto for that progressed aspect by going the long way around. So, anybody, any more questions? Oh, you look, all look so miserable. <laughs> <laughs> you may sit here looking at me such a... I read the question is now, where's my <laughs> Jupiter? Have you tried doing any of these Rectifying them? No, I haven't. Mm. But of course my children are like, four children with eight, eight past sons. You know, which is obvious, this comes through from my mother being. Oh, another interesting thing, which I didn't bring up, is that if you look at my moon, 306 of Capricorn, uh, Cancer. Cancer. Cancer, the mother's moon is 308 of Sagittarius. <coughs> and I've had a strange, uh, I haven't got the note in that one, but over the years I have found this note, the 1729. It seems that anybody who makes contact with that note is going to be somebody or seems to be somebody who has a lesson to teach me in life. This came about through one relationship that I had that ended and the next relationship I went into. The first person had Saturn, a 1729 of uh, Scorpio, and my second husband has got Mercury at 17.29 of Scorpio and I sort of thought, oh, wasn't that funny, you know? <laughs> Two relationships, both with a planet at that same degree and minute as my mind. So then I started to sort of go through it and people that have been teachers in my life who have taught me things of importance, who have had a bearing on my life, seem to make some sort of contact with it. No, the 17 degrees, I got very spooked about it a couple of years ago, the 17 degrees, that's really, uh, really phased me out. But of course, my mother's son is at 17.53, and three of my four children have got planets at 17 degrees of Scorpio. Trying my nose at 17 degrees. The person who probably taught me more astrologically than anybody I know would be Leon Forrest. Her Saturn was at 17 degrees of air. And so it goes on, these strange 17 degrees coming up. But, um, I rather like the moon business. And of course we're both moon, both mother and I are moon Saturn. Both moon can go Saturn. So she obviously had another two. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, she says, I sure have. I also worked for my mother. And uh, we were talking about her the other day and she was saying something and I called her a piranha. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will never live that down. Yeah. Right, no questions? <laughs> we're really putting my Jupiter in the tent, are we? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.